With rejection, for me, the thing that is taking me a very, very long time to really get to is to really understand that rejection is just a part of the process. That if everybody said yes to everything that it was that you wanted to do, you would never really value what it is that you end up getting to, to, to be able to do in the end. So I'm super excited today. I've got one of my lovely friends, Mr. Jam, in the place. Shedheads, my, my regular crew, you'll know we've been trying to lock this down for a bit. So... We're finally here, which is great. Most of you will know him from his energetic DJ sets or his radio presenting from BBC Radio 1 or now being the face of Capital Dance and, and presenting on Capital and the Capital Weekender. Um, over the years, he's been cementing himself as a as a standout producer too, working with some massive acts uh, and releasing a, some, a, some mad singles over the years. Um, so today on Twitch, we're going to chat radio. We're going to chat producing and his journey across the last few years. Let's get him in here. Super excited to have Mr. Jam. Hey, dudes. <laughs> yeah. It's working. Yeah. Yay. Yay, technology. Yay, Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you, my friend? Thank you for doing this. No, thank you for asking me. I, I'm really, really good. Yeah, you, you tweeted a while ago about potentially trying to get me in and have a conversation. I'm like, yeah, I'm down for it whenever. And I'm really happy that we've been able to make it happen. Thank you. Before we get into the, the, the super serious questions, we have a bit of fun here because it's lunchtime in the UK, and those of us who are not joining us in the UK, those of us, yeah, those of us are not in the UK. Where are you in the chat? Let us know. I'd love to know where you all are from. Yes. But in the UK, we have a we're, it's lunchtime, and on my streams, I don't know when this started, dude. We it, probably right at the very start, we were chatting about meal deals, and we love meal deals here. <laughs> and and, 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 and I, I know you know what a meal deal is. Because we've had some American guests and so, uh, that, that are like, but a meal for those that are joining us, a meal deal is basically you get them from our from the supermarket, and it's a combination of a sandwich, a a, a confectionery, and maybe a drink. Um, mine over the last few years, it used to be the kind of breakfast triple, super okay. unhealthy, like then always a packet quavers because I love quavers. Yeah. And then it used to be the, you know, the the smoothie drinks, which you think are really, really healthy or balance that super unhealthy uh, trip breakfast triple. They're not. They're full of sugar. Uh, but yeah. now it's now it's a salad and a crisp and a water. So I, I want to get you, what's your, do you have a meal deal? What, do you have a personal favorite? What do you go for? I do. And I kind of get, I, I get rinsed from my meal deal choice because when it comes to sandwiches, unless I'm making them, I really want them to be like simple. If I'm going to go into like a posh deli, there's like a, a shop in Bristol called Sandwich Sandwich where you go in there and you have a sandwich. If it's a yeah. supermarket thing, I want it simple. I don't want it too moist because when you got a salad <laughs> in that sandwich, it just makes the bread all wet. So I go for either a plain cheese or a plain ham and cheese. Nice. I go for a cheese and onion walkers or already salted walkers. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Quite plain. Yeah, I, I, I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm all about the cheese and onion. That's definitely my top three walkers. Um, <laughs> the fact I even have a top three walkers... <laughs> Roast chicken, cheese and onion, salt and vinegar. Oh, no, but I wouldn't yeah, go, go for salt and vinegar. I, I agree with roast chicken, I agree with cheese and onion, but I'd had a ready salted in there as well. Nice. My daughter likes ready salted. They are, we had a ready salted combo a while back. <laughs> it is the, it's plain, but it, it works. And if, you want, if you're going oh. into a service station, if you're going into a supermarket, it, you want the meal deal to just be nice and edible and it isn't going to mess up with your stomach. So, yeah. I will go with a ham and cheese or just a plain cheese, a ready salted walkers. I will go for a Pepsi Max cherry. Always a Pepsi Max cherry. Ooh, that's a good yeah. choice. Just just in, just in case we uh, we run too long, I've got <laughs> I've got a can here. <laughs> Great. And when it comes to confectionery, it depends on what mood I'm in. Uh, at the moment, I've I've rediscovered my love for the humble Cadbury's Whisper. Nice. Yeah, yeah. we had one of those yesterday. They're nice. Delicious. Delicious. Yeah. Simple. Very again, simple. Good choices. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. People agreeing with the Pepsi Max Pepsi Max uh cherry. Yeah. And the cheese and onions. Cheese and onions. A lot of people are going with the cheese and onions as well. And whisper gold. Wow, whisper gold. And now you see you ruin a whisper when you put caramel in it, as far as I'm concerned. Like a caramel in a chocolate bar needs to needs to involve some sort of biscuit. If you're just putting caramel in chocolate, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Oh, crunch! People are saying crunchy. People are saying man. The 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 Neil Deal chat is full on going in the chat. So good on you, everyone's going on. The spa Space Raiders. I love a Space Raider. Yeah, I'm just going to scroll back. Right, let's get cracking. 
Um, I want to. I thought we'd start right at the start because you and I have not had this chat, and I know we've had it. We've yeah. been talking about it for a while, and I know we kind of, you know, we chat a lot, and we've not done it fully online. So I thought we'd we'd start right at the start. Like you grew up in Nottingham, didn't you? I did. Yeah. What was your childhood look? When did you find music? Let's go. Let's go <sighs> right to the start. Right to the very start. I'm an only child, born and raised in Nottingham, um, a part of Nottingham called Arnold. My granddad lived in a part of Nottingham called St. Anne's. My grandma lived in a part of Nottingham called Radford. So I'd kind of travel around those areas. Uh, I had uh, my dad's family over in Bessel Park and we kind of, you know, very much a Nottingham boy. I discovered music really, really early. Um, And it's not really for a, a beautifully nice reason. I was just always obsessed with music because my neighbors were not the nicest of people. And, you know, we're talking 80s. So, you know, things were said um, a lot more vocally in the 80s as they might have been said in the 2010s. We're back there now in 2023. Uh, But my Mm. my neighbours were really, really racist. And they used to shout a lot of racist abuse up to me in my bedroom. And so I would listen to a lot of music and drown them out. And music became my salvation. Music became my kind of my go-to and I was obsessed with music. I was the kid that if ever, you know, there was a play date arranged around at your house, if you had a record collection, I'd go and have a look at your record collection. I'd spend nice. hours reading liner notes. I, I mean, look, I, if, if this isn't just for this stream, but I've even got my first ever record frames that I keep on my wall. Nice. Where's the camera? That there way, you go. Way, that way, yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep it framed. Nice. That is the actual first record I ever owned with the complete with rips <sighs> and like wow. toddler doodles on there and everything. So wow. yeah, I new, used to, new shoes. I can't wait. 1986 classic. <laughs> I've not heard but of yeah. it. Not... <laughs> Mate, you know it. You know it. If you hear it, you know it. I'm going to Google it after. I'm not going to sing it to you. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to Google it after for sure. But no, um, I, I just, I used to spend so much time listening to music, being into music. I was just the music geek, really interested in music and and, and wherever I could get hold of music, I'd listen to the radio. Uh, you know, I'd listen to uh, anything that I could find. I had, you know, cousins around me and aunts and uncles that were really inter- interested in music as well. And because I was kind of the musical one of the family, I inherited all of their record collection that then started nice. record collection. And yeah, even like... Um, kind of paper shops back when I was a kid, they used to do X jukebox <laughs> records. So oh, yeah. all of my like pocket money would, would be gone on, on spending like 20 pence for X jukebox vinyls. So yeah, nice. obsessed with music. Nice. And then, and then when did the DJ start? What did the, did it, was it, did it go radio first or did it go DJ first? How did, how did that kind of play out in the journey? Well, it's funny because coming from Nottingham, there's very few people that you can look up to, you know, being a working class black kid from Nottingham, you go, who else has done this? Who else has Mm. got a career trajectory that I can aspire to? Who's come from where I come from and and gets to, you know, the top of the food chain. And there were so few examples. So I didn't really know what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, As a small kid, I got really interested in acting and and started to work with the junior television workshop, um, which is it's amazing. It's an amazing place or it was an amazing place, still is an amazing place. Uh, so, you know, if you've ever seen anything that Shane Meadows has ever done or, you know, Vicky McClure was was kind of one of the group mates that I, I grew up with and there's so many people. But I, I was so obsessed with music that when it came time for the Junior Television Workshop Christmas parties, I wouldn't be interested in spending time with anybody else. I'd stand next to the DJ. And was really interested in what he was doing. And to the point where one Christmas when I was about 12, he said to the guy that ran the workshop, next year, you don't need to book me, just book him. Because I was telling him what records to play and how to play it and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> nice. from that point, it was like, okay, I actually, I'm interested in trying to learn how to do this properly. So there was a community kind of recording studio at the Heisen Green Youth Club run by a guy called Courtney Rose. And he did this project called Dark, which stood for Drugs Awareness, Reality and Knowledge. And the idea was, is that you'd go and do, it's funded by the council, you'd go and do some kind of drugs awareness work, you'd do black history. And if you did well in those, you got access to the studio out the back of the youth club. And this wow. is, we're talking, you know, mid to late 90s. So this is a studio with a reel-to-reel tape, with a mixing mm. desk, with an Atari with Cubase on there, you know, it, it, Akai samplers and cool. two turntables and a mixer. So I would do as well as I possibly could in the other studies to make sure that I had time in the studio. And from there, I learned how to DJ. A guy called DJ Fever was the DJ tutor. 
and then things kind of started from that point onwards of me learning how to do it properly, me learning how to produce. I started to learn studio engineering and production before I actually touched <laughs> a pair of decks. But yeah, that's that's kind of a, a short but detailed back history of, of how I started. That's so cool. That's such an opportunity as well for you as a young person. They don't exist as much as they should do. And, you know, Courtney Rose and Trevor Rose, they're still very active in Nottingham. They're still very active in giving young kind of working class kids an opportunity to, to be able to get into a recording studio and learn their craft. And mm. there should be more of it, but there isn't. You know, funding has been cut for youth clubs. Funding has been cut for this kind of thing. But I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the fact of initiatives like those that allow people with an interest the ability to go somewhere and learn. I think there's one in, because I'm in Milton Keynes and I think there's one, I think there's one, there was one in the point in the old, the old, the old cinema in Milton Keynes and this, they were doing like youth stuff, undeveloped, under, under, underprivileged, underdeveloped, underprivileged kids. Um, and there was, they were doing some radio there as well, but I don't know whether that's still going, but yeah, that's, that's sad. It's isn't here it? and far between. It is, it is. It really is. <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, for, for working class kids who really don't have that much of a route in, there's mm. so few opportunities. And I think you have to be in certain parts of the country where the, the funding still exists for you to be able to get involved in these things. You know, there's community stations in Manchester, there's community kind of projects in certain areas of London and South London, et cetera, et cetera. But there's mm. not all over, all across the country. So, you know, I was lucky being the age that I am, being, you know, where I was at that point in time, where there was still funding, where there were these still these things for someone like me who just had a passion and a dream to be able to learn how to do it properly. That's cool. And then, and then early gigs started and early DJing and kind of went yeah. playing out. Did that happen? Initial, yeah, initial kind of early gigs were with, with, there was like a group of us at this youth club and we, we got this booking to go and play at a club in Manchester. That turned out to be the Hacienda in Manchester. That was kind of the first professional gig. I mean, I was 14 at the time and it shut down forever about three weeks after we, they, we were there. So probably because they were letting 14 year olds in to go and DJ. But, <laughs> yeah. um, that kind of was the first thing. Doing a lot of youth clubs, a lot of, you know, wherever I possibly could get the chance to play music to people. They, again, you know, you'd, you'd start to try and do stuff. And then some things happened in, you know, the acting world for me. And I went off and did that. And then when I came back, I linked up with uh, a friend of mine, Joe Buda in Nottingham, and we started to put on our own events. And the cool. idea was, is that, you know, no one was booking us. Uh, I should say no one was booking me. I can't talk for him because they were booking him. Uh, no one's booking <laughs> me. So what is it that I can do to get my name out there? What is it that I can do to show that I know what I'm doing and that I can actually hold a crowd and, and to learn my craft? So it was about putting on our own events. You know, I, I spent a few years, there's a, a legendary uh, drum and bass night in Nottingham called Detonate. I used to, you know, play the back nice. room at Detonate, uh, get paid, not a lot of money, but, you know, try and learn my craft there. We'd put on our events. We'd try and do whatever it is that we possibly could. A, a nightclub called The Bomb in Nottingham, I used to play there. But any time that I was kind of playing, it was probably because I was putting the night on myself and mm. spent a very long time as a promoter. And that is definitely something that I don't want to go back to ever again. Uh, I, ended up with, <laughs> I ended up with kidney stones because of that. So no, we're not going to do that again. Um, oh, but yeah, it was a oh, case of putting myself on the lineups and then, you know, trying to see what it is that I could do. Yeah, I hear you on that. I hear you on that. I hear you on the putting on gigs. We've tried to do it so many times. Oh my days. It's so stressful. Hats off to Ellie. Where's a hat? I've got, I've got, hat. I've got plenty of hats got in hat. here. <laughs> I've got, I've got, mate, I've got fucking hundreds of hats in here. There's, 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 there's a whole, there's a whole host of hats. Which hat would you like? I've got, I've got, a, I've got a hats off. Oh, that's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Hats off. Yep. Oh, you've got your Stetson. I'm a celebrity Stetson. Go on. Yep. Yep. We've, it, basically, in my, in my, in, I'm in my shed in my garden. So for those that don't know in the chat, I basically, I stream from my shed in the garden. We set this studio up when I started streaming on Twitch. And basically over there, there is a big old point, a fancy dress chest. We've got we've got <laughs> wigs. Sort of, we've got a wig drawer here. Look, just full of wigs. Wow, uh, it's it's a crazy old place in my shed. I love it's the disco, disco shed. shed. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. It started as a bit of a uh, as a bit of a party shed when we moved into the house. But then when we started streaming, we were like, we need somewhere to stream from, and we want it to kind of be permanently set up. You know. I know you've just been doing similar with your DJ with your DJ setup, and you want somewhere permanent that you can just leave up. Yeah, and then if come move, in and go if out. I'm, if I move the chair ever so slightly out of the way, you might see. Look. Yeah, Shut there you go. 
<laughs> so it's all set up behind me. Yeah. I am not resetting that at all. It took far too much, too much blood, sweat, tears. If anyone follows me on socials, you know. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Holy moly! Um, <sighs> and then, and then, and then, let's let's kind of just start on radio. When did we start radio? Because that's a big period of your life. When did that start? And then let's play, let's play some music. Absolutely. So radio for me started with Pirate. Um, tr- again, not knowing what to do or how to do it or thinking, how can I get into this? So I started on Pirate with uh, a couple of friends. We had a Pirate show. Uh, nice. And then uh, there was a limited uh, license granted to the Nottingham Trent University radio station, Fly FM, as it was called now. It's now called Fly Play Live or Play Fly Live. And the idea was, is that because they were given this FM license for a period of time, they had to have local residents on the station as well to be able to fulfill the terms of their license. So I was 16 on Nottingham Trent University's radio station doing a show. And that was lovely. That was amazing. That was the first time that I'd gone into like a radio studio where they had carts. So you play your jingle off an actual floppy disc. That's how old I am. Um, you know, nice. playing vinyl on the radio and doing all that kind of stuff. And then went back to Pirate. And then it was through one of the events that we were putting on in Nottingham that um, we invited one extra to come and do a live broadcast from. They saw me DJ. Of course, I'm going to DJ. It's my promotion. Um, <laughs> I'm the one that's losing money from this. Um, <laughs> and they said, do you do radio? So I was able to present them with eight hours of radio that I'd done. I'd gone home after the gig that night and recorded a demo show. They knew that I took it seriously. They invited me down to pilot. I piloted uh, with an amazing producer called Janine Campadu, and they offered me a show. And that was 2005. And that's kind of where my radio journey professionally began. But if it wasn't for the number of years that I spent on Pirate and doing kind of community radio before that, I wouldn't have been ready. That's mad. That's cool, though. That's a very cool start. Like the whole Pirate thing. I wish I'd, I wish I'd, you know, the things that you wish you'd done. I wish I'd been kind of around that when I was younger or just, I wish I'd been the, done the Ibiza summer, but yeah, definitely been around pirate. It, it sounds like, it sounds like super kind of a load of fun, but also kind of a lot of running and putting up aerials and just being a bit on your feet. And I wish I'd done that when I was younger. Again, I was, you know, what? I was really lucky because the, the, the station manager of the station that I was on was very clever. They realized, so back in the day, there was this thing called the DTI, which was the Department of Trade and Industry. And the whole thing was, is that pirate radio stations were illegal radio stations, but they were playing music that no other radio station was playing. They were giving opportunities to people that no other radio station was giving opportunities to. So the, the DTI would raid your radio station, take all of your equipment. They would, you know, take all of your records. Um, you know, Slimzy, who was part of the running of Rinse FM in London, became the first person to get an ASBO because of <laughs> running a pirate radio station. So the station manager was really clever. They were like, you deliver your show on Minidisc and we'll play the Minidisc out from an undisclosed location. No one knows where the studio is. You record your own show. You get to be on the radio, but it's kind of, it's risk averse. And I thought that was really clever. That's really cool. It's essentially, it's essentially what we do now with our pre-recorded shows on our, our own radio station. It's like, <laughs> but we're just, it's online. Wow, and also I love mini disc. I flipping love it. I've, I've got some. I still got a player over there. My, 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 my yeah, mini deck is over there. It's literally there. I'm, I'm just trying yeah, to figure out which way the camera is. It's there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, me too. I've got one in my office. I love them. I've, I've got a, the full Sony. I love mini disc. Holy moly! I was going to make some mini disc. I need to still do that actually. I was going to make some fif- mini disc for my fifteenth for the DT fifteenth birthday. Right. While hey. we've been chatting, I don't know if you know about Twitch Jam, but on Twitch we have a thing called the hype train, and it goes off when people just basically uh, add, give us some, some little sub and basically gift us money for being part of the stream and then enjoying the stream. They give us bits or subscriptions to the stream. We put them into new mics and new cameras and extra lighting or spinners and just extra stuff to help the help these streams. So, Has anybody done you an edit of KDOC's night train into the hype train? Because someone should. No. That'd be very All cool. All aboard the hype train. <laughs> Make it happen, Graham. Make it happen, Big G. <laughs> Well, there, there you go. You've now got the audio gang in the chat. Someone <laughs> clip this. Someone clip this. They've got Jam saying a hype trainer. In, in a, it sounded quite cool as well. So in that can be this month's challenge. Sample sample challenge in the Discord later. Go on, go on, clip Jam saying hype train and make it into no! make it in, and, and, and do that and do that edit. Go on, make it happen. Make it happen, gang. Make it happen. <laughs> I walked into that one, didn't I? <laughs> Oh, you did it. The thing is, you did it so well. You actually, like, it was, oh my God, so good. <laughs> right. While that hype train goes off, let, I, I thought we'd play some tracks during this to kind of break it up. You've been pretty prolific on the old production, pretty prolific on the production. We're going to talk about production loads in a bit. Um, and I'm going to kind of work 
for back and forward. Um, so right. I thought we'd start with your the Rotate track, which came out Ooh. 2018. 2018, yeah. Yeah, um, and we'll go forward to the newest stuff, and then we're going to play your brand new track, which I'm well excited about. But we'll start with this one, and we'll play a little clip of this. Well, we can have a little drink and a cup of tea. Um, tell us about this one. So this was the first record that I actually put out uh, as Mr. Jam. I'd done a lot of stuff before that, and I was too scared to put out music because I'd spent so long in my career helping other people put their music out. But um, my manager at the time was like, this is good. Let me send it to a few people. Uh, he sent it to uh, Cedric Gervais. Cedric really liked it. And he put it out on his label. And it ended up being, you know, used by the one and only Norman Cook, Fatboy Slim, in his entire kind of run of arena shows that year and the year afterwards. So, yeah, it's, it's, Love that. it's a special memory. Let's play this. And then we'll be back in a minute. Let's do this. Wicked. That's a banger. Let's give that a rave on. Thank you, mate. Love that. Thank you. Right. Before we play the track, we were chatting about sort of the early starts in radio. Um, let's get into the meat and the meat and bones. You join one extra first and then Radio One after that. Is that is that the correct journey? Yeah, so I, uh, I I started one extra in 2005. Uh, in 2006, I moved from just doing an overnight show to doing an overnight show on a Friday night show. In 2007, I started to do the weekday show that I did uh, for a decade there. And in 2008, started to do shows on Radio 1 after being asked to do something at a uh, big weekend and being spotted by Radio 1's bosses and them going, oh, he knows what he's talking about. He can hold a crowd. He's... He's done his research. He knows what he's doing behind a pair of decks. And um, yeah, so from 2008 onwards, I was on Radio 1 and 1 Extra until I left in 2020. Nice. Have you got any fa like fa favourite memories from that period of time? It was a long period of time. Um, yeah. Have you got any really fond ones that we can chat about? Uh, I mean, look, over the 15 years of being there, it was just, it was an amazing kind of place to to be there and really learn your craft. I think, you know, the thing about working for a corporation like the BBC is that, you know, they they definitely, uh, they, they, they harbour, shall we say, a healthy competitive nature with all of their broadcasters. And, and so, you know, being able to kind of ply my trade and learn really how to be a broadcaster, how to you know, be able to, to talk to that many people and to, to kind of play a part in introducing such great music to so many people, I think, you know, is, is, is it's very hard for me to pick out one particular thing that is a real highlight. There's so many over the years. But I think just looking back over the 15 years in total, the people that I was able to meet, you know, the, the, the songs that I was able to play, the relationships that I was able to kind of start, I think is, is, is all stuff that will live with me forever. And, and even, you know, going back to my early days as going to the junior television workshop and learning to be an actor and then being able to put that into some sort of practice of being on the radio. And, you know, within the 15 years of being there, it wasn't just Radio 1 and 1 Extra that I was at. You know, I'd managed to be on every single national BBC station doing something before I left. And it just kind of felt like I've done it all now. What's next? <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. Congrats, dude. That's so cool. And Thank then, you. and then, and then you left and, and, and start and started Capital Dance, and that's that's now we're now three, nearly three years into that. Three years in September, isn't it? Three years in September, yeah. Why did that happen? How did that happen? Let's talk about that move. Well, I think you know what twenty twenty was. It was, um, I suppose, lockdown for a lot of people. It, it it changed a lot of people's perspectives, and for me, mm. it forced me to kind of look at what it was that I was doing. It forced me to look at what I, you know, was was doing as a father, what I was doing as a broadcaster, what I was doing as a producer. You know, what was I actually doing in my life? And you know, when lockdown happened, us radio broadcasters on the whole were, were classed as key workers. So for me, I was still commuting in and out to be on radio. And it had felt like over the years of me being at the BBC, every challenge that I was given, I rose to and mm. smashed it. And then, mm. you know, it was very much a carrot and stick thing. You know, here's a carrot, try and get it, try and get it, and you get it. And here's a stick <laughs> we're going to beat. Do you know what I mean? It was kind of, it was a bit like yeah, that. And yeah, I just yeah. felt like I'd done everything that I was allowed to do. I'd achieved mm. everything that I was allowed to achieve. Any challenge that I'd been set, I'd, you know, been able to to rise to the challenge you know 
without going into too much detail, it just felt like I needed a change. And mm. it was almost like my work here is done, you know, not yeah, to, yeah. not to kind of, you know, be flippant or anything, but it just was like anything that I wanted to do and potentially could see my career growing towards, I knew wasn't going to happen for me there. Mm. And because, you know, lockdown was happening and everybody was doing a real proper, I felt like the entire world was reevaluating what they felt was important. I, I took that as a, as a real opportunity for me to make some changes. You know, the, the manager that I was working with, we, we, um, we kind of grew apart because he, he wanted to go and do some other things and I wanted to go into some other things. So it was a case of then trying to find new management. I was really, really happy with that. You know, my wife, she's been there by my side since day one. She really, really stepped up and she took control of all the broadcast side of things. And it was a few conversations with a few people because I'd got to this stage where I was like, look, I, I don't think I can stay where I am and maintain some sort of level of sanity. Who do I talk to and what do I do to try and get a bit of advice? So I picked up the phone to somebody that I knew that had left the corporation and been able to make it successful. And we were really good friends and still are. And that's Chris Moyles. So I phoned up oh. Chris and I was like, what do I do? <laughs> Here's my situation. Here's how I feel. What do I do? And he was like, what would you do? What's your dream? What would you do? And I pitched the idea of this station, Capital Dance, that would be a dance music station that is inclusive and not exclusive. Because I felt that, you know, at that point, dance music on British radio was very much about, it's almost like the mean girls, you can't sit with us. You know, you've got to be super cool in this super cool club. And, you've, you know, it's, it's almost like it's a sixth form common room and they're the ones that are in the corner controlling the stereo and you're not cool enough to come over here. Whereas I thought, you know what, with, for dance music, there's so many outlets for rock. There's so many outlets for pop. There's, there's so many outlets for lots of different genres where you get to know a little bit more about the artists, where you get to know a little bit more about their personality, where the music can be put together in a way that it is for all. And it is, as I say, inclusive and not exclusive. And he was like, I'm actually going to sit down with, the director of broadcasting for global i'm going to pitch him your idea do you mind him giving me, me giving you his number and i was like you go for it i didn't expect to hear anything from it but <laughs> i was driving <laughs> yeah i was driving home uh, after doing a, a show and i got a text message and i was on the motorway so i pulled over at london gateway service and i always remember and it was the director of broadcasting for global going chris Wells has given you my number uh given me your number is there any mileage in us having a chat and i was like yeah absolutely so, you know, whenever you're working with a big company and Global is the biggest broadcaster in Europe, you have to sign an NDA. So I signed an NDA and we started to have these conversations. <laughs> I pitched this idea of what Capital Dance could be, of what, you know, the vision that I had for it, of where it could sit within the marketplace, in the fact that, you know, it wouldn't, it records rather than getting one play on one radio station at like 11 o'clock at night on a Friday, it could allow records to get, 50 plays a week during the day on a platform that anybody can get hold of. And also it would mean that, you know, there's another route into being a broadcaster rather than feeling like you have to sound like this. You have to present your shows in this way. You have to do it this way. It could be another route. And they, they were like, yeah, this is a really good idea. So for me with, with, with the corporation, I, um, I'd been out of contract for quite a long while and during COVID the contracts weren't getting renewed. So I was out of contract. So I was able to hand in my notice on the Tuesday. I did my last show on one extra on the Thursday. I did my last radio one show on the Saturday and we launched Capital Dance the week after. I remember that as a mate, that's, that's a mental period of time. That's, 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 crazy. Mad. that's, yeah, that's, that's a, holy moly. That's a mad story. That's very cool. And then, and then where, like we're now three years down the line, you've, you, there's more presenters and I guess uh, there's, the, the, you're building out a team there and like you, you can, you, I still, you see at the start, there was like someone doing morning and then you and Coco Co in the evening. And now there's sort of more in the day and it's getting more and more full, more and more presenters. And like, what's the, what's, where are we down the, your roadmap and where do we want to, where is it? Where's the plan for the next year, for instance? Well, the good thing is it's not my roadmap. It's just growing. Like genuinely, it's just, this, this, we've got an ethos and there's a backbone and the people that I'm working with, you know, the, the, the the producers that it's a small but perfectly formed team you know there's there's a guy called Sam Brinkley who works his absolute backside off uh there's Lee Sevenoaks there's Brent Tobin there's loads of people that a small group of people that are really passionate about trying to build this thing that can be for everyone and the plans are to try and keep it growing you know for us it's really important that we that the very ethos of the station is that we are inclusive and not exclusive 
that it is about introducing music to an audience that love it and that want it, but might feel alienated to try and discover it from somewhere else. It's about giving a personality to dance music and dance music pr producers and, and giving them a chance to get their personality shown. It's also a chance to break some records. And when I say yes. break records, I don't mean like kind of Guinness Book of World Records breaking records, but actually play records that might be unfamiliar to someone to a point where it then becomes familiar and it hopefully then can become a hit. And we've had a, a few successes with that so far because we're a station that works on rotation. We work as a commercial radio station with a specialist track listing. That means that if your record makes it to our version of the A-list playlist, it'll get played 50 times a week and been put in front of just, just shy of a million people across that week. So it's, it's giving people that as an opportunity rather than just trying to get that one play on that show and hoping that that's going to move the needle. It's, it's trying to add to the ecosystem rather than take away from it. And it's, as I say, it's, it's trying to grow in a way that is truly organic and everybody is welcome. That's very cool. Uh, the goddess in the chat has just asked, what's the best way to get tracks played on Capital Dance in order to get them break, break that record? Um, I was literally my next question. So hey. we're, we're, on, we're on the same thing. Goddess, thanks for dropping that in. So yeah, where, where do we start? When we start, we've got a lot of new producers in the, in the chat. Where do they start? How do they, what's the best process for getting that record first heard and then into the playlist and up the, up the chain? I think it's exactly what you said there is exactly right. Up the chain. It's thinking about it as a chain and it's thinking about where are you as a producer, as an artist, where is your song in that chain? And it's being very honest with yourself. And this is something that I have to do as a producer and artist and it's going right. I always use a football analogy. And I always mess it up because I don't like football. My wife is the football fan. However, I'm going to use a football analogy. If you're playing Sunday League football, you're not going to get the call up for the Premier League. You're not going to get the call up for the England squad or the Wales squad, or you're not going to get the call up. And I say that to say, have you built your momentum? Have you got mm -hmm. yourself the early um, tastemakers, the early key champions that can really champion your music to the next stage? Have you... Just put something out on SoundCloud that you've got uncleared samples in that you want to be played on the radio. If so, going to a, a commercial radio station like Capital Dance first is probably not your first port of call. Your first port of call is get your listens up on SoundCloud. You know, get your social media up to a point where you are building a fan base, you're building momentum yourself. Get yourself to a space where you've cleared the sample, you've done the work, the record is maybe growing and you've, you've, you're now able to release it properly. You don't have to go to a major label, but you do have to get it released properly. And then once you've got it released properly, and I know, gee, you talk about this all the time on Fridays. Once you've got it released properly, continue to build with your momentum, continue to build your social media, continue to build your links into other people, send your music out to DJs, send your music out to people that can potentially champion you. And if they like it, on the whole, they will play it. We're still not at radio yet. We're still not there yet. If you've got an underground house record, we're not at radio yet. Because if you want to then get to radio, you've got to have a few things. First of all, is if you've got a groundswell behind your record and it's being played and it's being supported. Second of all, have you got a version that can be played on radio? Have you got a radio edit? Have you got a version that we could potentially play on radio? And third of all, What's your plan? What's your plot? Because radio in the whole ecosystem of breaking music, it's it's part of it, but it's not all of it. And if you've got a record that is absolutely flying on radio, but your streaming profile is nowhere, then that record isn't really going to go anywhere. If you've got a record that is an underground absolute banger, then chances are you can continue to build your career because other people in the clubs are playing your record. You might get bookings off the back of it. You can build yourself up to that radio record. That's a very, very long way of me saying Capital Dance shouldn't be your first port of call, but it is one of those places where you will be discovered if you're doing all the other stuff that you're supposed to. And there's so many artists that we've played on the station that to our audience are brand new, but to a very mm. dedicated audience, this is what, year five of them building their momentum? Right. That's mad. That's very cool. And that's just changed my whole strategy for my new release. Thanks. <laughs> Look, I mean, I've been making music. That's super as I say. Cool. <laughs> I've literally been making music since I was 14 years old. I'm 40 years old and I'm still learning. You know, anybody that is one of those overnight has a viral success, especially within our dance music world. Nine times out of 10, unless you've done the groundwork, you will be here today, gone tomorrow. 
if you are interested in having a career in what it is that we love and what we do, and my thing is always to go back to being the boy with his Fisher Price record player in his bedroom. Can I make a song that's going to make somebody feel the way that I felt in that room? Can I help somebody with the music that I'm making? Can I change someone's mood with the music that I'm making? If you're in it for that, then you don't need to worry about anything else. You just need to worry about making sure that your music is strong and you're continuing to move along the journey. If mm. you're in it to try and make a quick book, that train sailed in the late nineties and they took all the money with it. <laughs> so it's not <laughs> left. <laughs> can that, can that, can that chain of motion, and we're talking about this kind of chain of motion where it's, you know, it starts on cloud cloud and it builds and it builds and it builds. I guess that chain can happen quickly. Like I guess it can happen sometimes over weeks instead of months and you know, years, I guess, depending on the momentum it gets, then you can hit, get a record. A record can start with you on Cover to Dance quicker than it would you know, other records, for instance. Absolutely. And that's the thing. You could hear something that I've done social posts on that I actually have to remind myself because I am very much unchecked, a glass half empty kind of person. And of course, I'm always wearing a couple of hats because there's one of them where I'm a radio broadcaster and I've been on radio for a number of years, but there's the other one where I'm a creative and an artist and a producer and a songwriter. So what I will do is I will compare myself to everybody else. And I wonder why such and such is getting that play and such and such is getting that and such and such, but I'm not. And what more do I need to do? And it's not fair because they're getting it and I'm not. And what I'm doing every single time is I'm comparing my insides to other people's outsides and I'm getting caught short every single time because mm. social media is a highlight reel. So when you're going on social media or when you're looking at stuff that's happening for other people, if you're constantly comparing yourself to other people, you're forgetting what's happening for you. You know, you might be getting those streams on your SoundCloud and they might be better streams on your SoundCloud than the last four things that you released. But if you're looking at what's in the Beatport top 10, you're going to dismiss those streams on your SoundCloud. As mm. soon as you start comparing yourself to other people, comparison is the thief of joy and you're just going to end up in a space where you're just going to end up bitter. The reason why I say that in this particular instance is because, yeah, there are some records that will be, that will move quicker. But there's also records that take a long time. Jengi's Bell Mercy very recently went super viral. That record was made two years ago, and it's mm. taken two years for it to become an overnight viral hit. Yeah, and I saw that. I, I saw that. I saw that Kim Key, what Kim Kim Kimic one. That's like I saw the the guys talking on Facebook, and they were like, well, "We've done a million plays on SoundCloud in a week," and I was like, "What is this record? Shit, how have I missed it first and foremost?" And then, and then, yeah, it was like that's that's crazy numbers, obviously for. A, Anyway. It is crazy. It is crazy. Absolutely. And, and there's a lot of those kind of Irish producers and Scottish producers at the moment that have got a real core fan base on SoundCloud and they've built their own momentum because they're share, there's an ecosystem of producers. There's an ecosystem of, of, of platforms that are supporting each other. So it's, it's not a surprise to see these records grow and grow and grow. But will these records end up being hit records? Who knows? The only thing you, you're in control of is yourself. And the only thing that you are in control of is what you put into your own music. And if you're constantly comparing yourself to other people in an unhealthy way, then that's going to really inform your art and you're not going to be able to make the best music that you possibly can. So I say that to say every record is going to have its own journey and every artist is going to have their own journey. If you focus on yours, then your journey is your journey. Um, John B. Beta, welcome into the chat, dude. Hey, doing Twitch partner? Uh, can you hey. ask if there's a, have have plans for a ca on a? Have, can you? Well, we're scrolling fast. Hang on. Can you ask if there are plans on Capital Dance for specialist dance shows or at least more non-specific mainstream songs, i.e., techno, drum and bass, grime, rather than just mainstream commercial dance charts, chart dance music? I think uh, first and foremost, John B., you're an absolute legend. Uh, uh, I, I, I've you know I've been a big fan of your music for a number of years, and also I wish that I had hair like you. I think it's unfair to say that Capital Dance only plays commercial chart dance music. Jamie Jones, currently on the uh, the, the the playlist, he doesn't make commercial dance music. He's you know, one of the coolest DJs in the scene. You know, there's there's so many different shades of music that the station plays. But again, the station is the station. The station its job within the ecosystem is not the same as a community radio station. Its job within the ecosystem is not the same as the super specialist um, 3 a.m. radio show on other platforms that is purely about those purists. Its job is to amplify. 
Its job is to be inclusive. Its job is to make sure that we're playing the best of what's available across the broad spectrum. So there's underground records that are being played during daytime. There's independent records that are being played during daytime. There's major label records and there's there's records from people that are super established and not super established. But the one thing is, is that everything that gets played on the station is at that point in its life cycle where it would make sense for it to be on rotation on a station that plays a playlist 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That then means that you can have that amount of rotation. I have heard people say that they think that Capital Dance is dropping the ball. I would say maybe Capital Dance isn't for you. I would say that what Capital Dance is for is for anybody that loves dance music and wants to be able to put on the station and feel like there's a space for them. Does that answer the question or do you think that I'm being too yeah. politician? I- no, 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 that's great. I, I like I totally I, I totally get it. Like everything has a, everything in this world has a space and you know your space and it, and you're right. Jamie, like I saw someone in the chat saying Jamie Jones has 1.3 million people followers on, on Spotify. Dude, that's still tiny. Like that's still tiny. You think that's 1.3 is big again, because, we, you, because, again, because you have a- We go back to the comparison thing. We go yeah. back to the comparison thing. It's, oh, well, oh, well, yeah, they've got this amount of people and I've only got that. Well, build, mm-hmm. build your stuff. Yeah. I'm doing exactly the same thing as an artist. I 100% mm-hmm. get the frustration. And I spent mm-hmm. decades trying to bang on the door. And I still have it right now where there's so many spaces where I'm on, I'm not welcome. I'm persona non grata. And the point is, is that as soon as you start comparing yourself to others, you take away your joy. And if you've got a record that you truly believe in, believe in it and build your momentum. That's exactly what I'm doing. That's exactly what I have to do. And to be honest, it's it's hard for me because politics mean that there are certain things that I'm never going to be able to do. So I'm just having to do the best that I can with music that I truly believe in. But I get where people's frustration comes from. I think, Mm. have a look at what Capital Dance plays, have a look at the playlist, and you'll see that there are unknown artists. There are very well-established artists. There's underground artists. There are commercial dance artists, but not that many. And the music that we play is music that you can rotate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right, let's play. Let's play a record. Should we play another record. Which that was great chat on radio. I love chat. That was so cool. Let's play another record. Uh, Monday, kind of Tuesday on a Wednesday. Yay. Let's 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 play another record, and then we'll jump into chatting about production because I'm well excited to hear about that. So let's play this first. There we go. Let's give that the rave on. <laughs> well, before we leave the radio section behind, there's a great question from Chrissy Megan in the chat, which which I was thinking about as well, which, I, which I'm going to ask you now before we jump in. I don't know if you know, dude, but last year on April Fool's Day, we uh, announced that we were me and my assistant were going on Radio 1 and we were taking over Danny Howard that evening. It went bonkers. And we had so many people, so many record labels, first and foremost, are going, hey, Graham, can you play my record tonight? Which was which was funny. But like even my assistant went into his hairdressers in this, t- this small town in Daventry, and they were like, oh, I hear you going on radio. Like, it went that far. It was ridiculous. But the question from... The, yeah, so the question for him, and also for me, is any advice to break into radio? I'm currently on a commercial radio, commercial radio in Scotland, but want to take the next step. I think that that is a very, very good question. And unfortunately, there is no simple answer because no two radio broadcasters, no two DJs, no two producers have got the same origin story. It's borrow a marvelism. You know, it's, uh-huh. it's all about right now where we are within technology is that everybody's got the ability to be able to develop their skill as a broadcaster in their own hands. You know, you're in your shed. I'm in my studio at home. You've got a device in your hand that can record broadcast quality audio that allows you to edit social media posts, that allows you to speak to the world. There are places like Mixcloud, there are places like Soundcloud where you could create your own radio show and you can get what we would call in the broadcast industry your air mile. 
Talks, your chance to be behind the microphone presenting a radio show in the way that you want to present it. So what I would say is get your air mile. And then once you've got your air miles, don't be afraid to send your demos to people at radio stations and independent production companies that make radio shows for those radio stations that you would like to work for. Again, to go back to my horrible football analogy, think about how you can work your way up the chain. Not many people will go straight to the very top from complete obscurity. Even those people that you might never have heard of that you hear getting jobs on national radio, they've got air miles behind them. They know what they're doing behind the microphone. They know what they're doing if they're in a studio and the fire alarm goes off, or they know what they're doing if they're in a studio and <laughs> a monarch passes away, which, you know, has happened. Happen. So it's yep. that kind of stuff. It's, it's also having a listen to where radio sits and going, what kind of a presenter would you want to be? Do you want to be the kind of, you know, specialist, super cool, speaking to a small yet niche, but very, very, um, you know, dedicated audience about one particular thing? Or are you interested in communicating to as many people as possible? If so, it's different styles, develop your styles. So yeah, in, in a roundabout way, it's, it's, Think about what it is that you can do for yourself rather than constantly going to try and see whether other people can do stuff for you because there's so many opportunities. Twitch is a perfect place. Twitch is a perfect place for you to be here and start your own show. Yeah. Do it. Let's do it. Um, wicked. Thanks, dude. Right. Uh, let's talk production. Uh, I remember being in Ibiza maybe five, six, maybe longer years ago and you played me loads of unreleased tracks and we were like, fuck, these are wicked. Why are you releasing them? And uh, and I think you touched on it earlier that about nerves or kind of not thinking you're ready or whether it's imposter syndrome or what changed? How did that come about? Like, uh, I have got a very, very loud critical inner monologue that tells me that I am a piece of shit at any given point in time. So what would oh. happen... <laughs> hey, welcome to being a creative. Uh, what would happen for me was that I would make this music and it would sit on my hard drive. And, you know, being as grateful as I am for having the kind of the broadcasting career that I'd been able to forge. As I say, I started out in the recording studio. I started out learning how to stripe a tape, use an Akai sampler, using Cubase on the Atari. I moved from that to Logic when it was owned by a company called eMagic. Like people think that Logic was always an Apple product. No, it used to be owned by a company called eMagic and Apple bought it. Uh, I moved to Reason for a period of time thinking, this is, it looks like outboard gear and that's how I learned. So maybe I can figure it out. I, I, I then moved over to Ableton and I was just making this music. I've made music all the way through. I've had a radio career, but I just wasn't confident because what would happen for me is that I would make this song and I would then compare it to the new Eats Everything record that I, uh, I get the chance to play for the first time on radio later on that night. And I go, no, nah, this is shit. <laughs> or I'd make a tune and, and then all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm playing this artist called Ed Sheeran on radio for the first time and, and he's blown up and I've got, no, nah, this is shit. And so what would happen is that I would just have these songs that would just gather digital dust on my hard drive. And I played them to a few people to try and see whether or not there was anything in it. And you were one of the kind people, G, that were like, yeah, there's something in this. I remember I played a couple of things to MK and MK was like, dude, just get out of your own way. Get out of your own mm. way. What are you doing? <laughs> just get out. Just put it out. Get out of your own way. And I was like, okay, you know, if some decent people are telling me that this is all right, then maybe I should. And, and it was my, my old manager, Sean Holbrook, that I'd sent stuff to. And he was like, this is all right. This needs a lot of work, but this one's all right. And that's where kind of Rotate came from. And then when lockdown happened, it was a case of, right, well, I'm spending a lot of time in the studio. I know what I'm doing. I want to take a step up. And when it was a, a time for me to, to try and find new management, I was really, really, um, I don't want to say lucky because I don't believe in luck. I'm really grateful that the guys at Club Class, that Kev and Serge at Club Class Management took my call and we had a conversation and they saw where I could potentially take my production to if I had the belief. And what they've done for me since then, working in tandem with my wife, Claire, who manages all the broadcast stuff, is that they've gone, you focus on the music, we'll focus on everything else. You send us the tunes. Don't worry about where it's going to go. Don't worry about anything else send us the music and we'll see where it goes. And for me, that was really hard because, you know, I've had a large amount of knockbacks as every single creative, as every single producer has. You know, if I had a pound for every label that said, no, thanks. If I had a pound for every DJ that went, 
no cheers, thanks. I actually would be able to take the rest of the year off. It's all about that process of just making sure, pulling it all the way back to why was I interested in making music in the beginning? And the reason why I was interested in making music in the beginning is, again, going back to being that kid that had this bloody seven inch. (laughs) Gee, I'll go one step further, mate. Well, at least one it. In the chat, one's in the chat if, you, if you're feeling him on the, on the knockbacks. Uh, what is this. that? What is that uh. thing? What is... Oh, my day. All oh, right, okay, all oh, my days. <laughs> my first deck. Nice. My first deck. <laughs> nice. But taking it <laughs> back to good. those days, taking it back to that and going, why am I doing this? Why am I interested in this? And mm. does it really matter if I'm going to get these knockbacks? I remember... You know, we're going back to 2014 where I'd reached out to a label because they had a record and I was really interested in remixing the record. And they said, yes. And I, you know, started to do this remix. And I was really, really proud of this remix. And I sent it into their A&R and they'd already said yes. And they'd approved this remix. And then they're like, well, why don't you come into our studios? You can work on it some more. So I took it into their studios and and they kind of were like, um, uh, no, it's just not good enough. No, it's just not good enough. And I'm like, well, why did you string me along for this length? Of t- you could have just said no at the start, but no, it was just, mm. so that knocks me for a while. But then everything that has happened for me in my career up until this point, I see as a necessity. It had to happen because I truly believe that what is meant for you will happen for you. And all you've got to do is suit up and show up and be willing to put the work in. And what is meant to happen will happen just as long as you're willing to put the work in. I'm rambling. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> it's all good. I just think, like, going back to the comparison thing, that's like with the, the when you're saying about Ed Sheeran and you're saying about Eats, playing those Eats Everything records, that must have been like, it must have been a, a more difficult level because where you were at a career, where you were at working, where you were at, you know, you're playing, obviously playing gigs and DJing quite a lot then. So, where where some of these new producers in our chat will be starting right at the very bottom. They're not on Radio 1. They're not playing big gigs. So they're comparison, they're comparison, and they, they can do those smaller labels. They can do the kind of grind up the chain. Your chain must have been, your, your comparison level is a lot, lot higher. So you're having to get music to a much higher level right at the very start. Does that make does that make sense? It, it does make sense, but it's a myth. And it's something that I, I, I've i forgotten because regardless of where anything is, look, you know, you can be somebody that has developed a career in one particular area and then you go and decide to focus on what is your passion, but you've got to mm. start all over again. You can't carry that over. And for me, it was forgetting that I'm starting at the bottom. For me, and and, and this is where I am right now with my career, you know, mm. there's gigs that I'd love to play that I'm I'm not playing. You know, there's calls that I would love to get that I'm not getting because I'm not there yet. Because people, mm. you know, they they think of me and they think of one particular thing. They might have thought of something that went viral on YouTube seven years ago. They might have thought of, you know, a record that I played for them 12 years ago. You know, they're not really understanding what it is that I'm doing now or what it is that I'm really passionate about doing. So The whole thing for me is that I'm starting all over again. It's destroy and rebuild. So for anyone who is a producer, for anyone that is interested in truly making music that means something, it doesn't matter what else you're doing, you're starting at the bottom. And for a long time, I genuinely thought maybe what I should do is I should start an alias and put music out under an alias because then it will circumnavigate everything. I thought, well, no, because I started out making music as Mr. Jam. I've been Mr. Jam longer than I've been anything else. (laughs) <laughs> that name was something that I, I, I discovered and, and gave myself when I was 14. Why should I change my name? I'm just going to have to take the long route around on this journey. And that's that's where I am. So for regardless of who you are, it's about building up. And I'm doing exactly the same thing. Um, and then, like, for the last few years, you've had some mad releases. We had John Newman on this stream and we, we chatted about... We, that's a mad record. John Newman and working with David Guetta, that's just that's a that's a big record, dude. Congratulations, first and foremost. And that must have been a massive step forward for you and a massive confidence boost as well. It was. It was. So literally, you know, within the space of what, two and a half years, I'd gone from being too scared to release anything to a song that I'd written with with John Newman and Ollie Green being sent to David Guetta and David loving it so much that he's like, let's do it together. That was that was nuts. That was absolutely mm. crazy. And you know what? Say what you want about David Guetta. He is extremely talented. He is extremely generous with his time. And he's just one of the most he's one of the nicest people within the dance music industry. You know, he he will he has he he will give his time to anyone. 
And he really, really cares about it. You know, if you look into his history, he was DJing gay clubs in Paris in the late 80s because this was the music that he loved and that was the only place where he could play this music. You know, mm. you fast forward to now and he's one of the biggest names in the world. And, you know, to go back to our previous conversation, if you are going to compare, look at David Guetta's monthly numbers compared to Jamie Jones's number, monthly numbers and you can yeah. understand the difference. But... Yeah. David cares and he's really passionate about it. And one of the things that, again, I learned from the process of working with him and John Newman was just about connecting it to your passion, connecting it to why you care, connecting it back to whatever the record does, why are you making this record? Why is this record important to you? What what are you doing it for? And, you know, for David, being someone who's got that level of success to actually really care about that stuff, I think it's really important. I agree with you. I, I love the I love the dude. I've interviewed him once. I used to. I, I agree with what you're saying. Like we used to have him turn play at turn mills on a Saturday night. It was him, Bob Sinclair, and DJ Gregory, and it was he used to play three vinyl all night long with with those three. The three of them would be in their booth all night long and just kind of rotating. And it was fucking excellent. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, you have been there. Like <laughs> you've been there. It's, it's it, I agree with you. I, I I'm a big fan of David Guetta. Um and. When I saw it, I was like, I was bu- like, literally, when I saw it announced, I was buzzing for you. I was like, this is a, this is a big deal, and it's great, and it's great for you, first and foremost, you know? So, again, yeah, let's, should we play that record? Let's play it now. Yeah, go for it. There we go. That's a big tune. I I saw a good question there. Um, And I think it might be good. And I saw someone else use it. Basically, when we had John Newman on, we created his own button. And I'm going to use that button right now for you as well. Because I think it's one thing. It's This is a thing that Fat Supply really needs to know. Uh, So let's use this button. (laughs) So Fat fat, fat Supply really needs to know... If she wants to to uh, collab with Mr. Jam, how does that happen? And do you have to know them personally? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And thank you very much for that question, Fat Supply. I think it's one of those things where there's no set rules for collaborations, is there? There's not really any set rules whatsoever, especially in the current um, music industry. For me, uh, I reach out to people that I'm interested in working with. And if the idea is right and they are interested in working with me, then we'll work on something. Um, there's a lot of people that have said no, which I really, really, uh, I, I respect actually. No, thanks. Mm. Not interested. Uh, or it's not quite right for them or whatever, but you know, for reaching out for collabs, then feel free to reach out and fat supply. If you've got an idea, if you've got something that you think we could potentially work together on, if I'm into it, I, you know, get it through to me. You know how to do that. There's loads of ways that people can get in touch with me. Um, if I'm not, then I will always be honest and go, I'm not really, no, thank you, or whatever it may be. The other thing is, is that with rejection, for me, the thing that has taken me a very, very long time to really get to is to really understand that rejection is just a part of the process. That If everybody said yes to everything that it was that you wanted to do, you would never really value what it is that you end up getting to, to, to be able to do in the end. So there might be a collaboration that you might want to do with a particular artist and you might send it to them and they might go, no, thank you. It doesn't matter. It might not have just worked. It wouldn't have worked out anyway, but you might have a collaboration that you could send out to an artist and they go, yes, please. And you get the collaboration and you do it and it's finally finished and you put it out there and nothing happens. Again, that was supposed to be part of your journey. So in a very roundabout way, get in touch with me. Feel free to send it through. If I'm interested, I'll, I'll respond. If I'm not, because I am sent a lot of stuff, then I won't. Simple. Let's talk about production. Kind of how we yes. produce it now. What's your project? What's your processes now? How are you approaching stuff? So for me, I, I, I use Ableton. Um, Ableton, I think, works the way that my brain works, um, which is <laughs> it's probably it's very weird. <laughs> but kind of from my background of learning how to produce and the way that I kind of look at audio, I, I, I learned how to use Ableton first and foremost as an audio editor. So then to then produce in Ableton, I think is is why it works so well for me. I, I, it, it depends on the song. It really depends on the song. And what I've really been focusing on over the last couple of years is really developing my skill as a songwriter. Mm-hmm. And to be able to be a good songwriter and to be able to be a good producer, I see it, 
is that you need to develop your skills in learning how to collaborate with people, is learning how to work with other people and really understanding what it is that you bring to the table that is so unique compared to what anybody else can bring to the table, but know that it is a table that you're bringing it to. And for so many years, I wanted to do everything myself and thought I had to do everything myself. Whereas what's happened with me focusing on being a songwriter is that when you walk into a room and you're walking into a room with collaborators, you're sharing ideas and it's ultimately what is best for the song. And then once we've got the song to a space where we're all in a, a agreement that it's, it's right or I feel that it's right, I'll then take it away and I will spend days, weeks, months working on making sure that the production feels where I need it to be. And sometimes I'll send it to a couple of people for their ideas to see what it is that they could potentially bring to it. And if we end up with a product that at the end of it feels like what I was trying to say in the first place, then happy days. If we end up with something where I don't feel like it's what I really want to do, then it kind of sits on the hard drive. And, you know, it's, it's, there's an Ed Sheeran quote that I really love, which is about, you've got to write a thousand shit songs before you write one decent one. <laughs> and that's exactly the same, regardless of what genre you're working in, whether you are sat in your bedroom on Ableton. And, you know, the thing that I get from a lot of people is, oh, it's all right for you because your phone book means that you can collab with anybody in the world. That's not the case. Not, not, not only is that not the case, but it's not about who you collaborate with. It's about the ideas that you share. And if you've got a mate that writes poetry and you're looking for a vocal for your track and your mate potentially comes over with one of his poems and records that vocal over that, one of his poems over your track, that might elevate your track higher than it ever was. Uh, that it was ever going to be. And from what I've been told, that's the story of Faithless, that Maxi Jazz was a poet that people knew, that Sister Bliss knew, that was like, we need a vocal for this instrumental. Let's bring him in and try him out. And lo and behold, you get Salvamia, you get Insomnia. Mm. So again, it's it's not about looking at the bigger people to collaborate with. It's about who's around you. Who are the people that you know that have talent? And who else? You know, this community that you're building here, G, so many people could work together. So many collaborations could happen. And also, I'm going to call you out and say you are a brilliant producer. So, you know, call, call Big Grand Farmer right here because he's brilliant. <laughs> he can help you. Well, thank you, for, thank you for giving that track. <laughs> thank you for giving that. Firstly, Jam, thank you for giving that track some air on Radio 1. It, it meant the world to me and young Hobbs in the chat. Uh the eight, the eight weeks of that of good times being on the on the radio one was absolutely amazing. It was a mad summer for us. We had people ringing people ringing us up, and we had a WhatsApp group calling into Radio One every Saturday night, which which was funny um, and trying to make it happen. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, it was good fun. I know you were talking about finding new finding vocal like you've been working with lots of newer vocalists, and how are you finding yeah. them? Is that kind of from a social thing? Is it from a management thing? Is it from just you hunting? Where where are we finding these vocalists? All of the above. Absolutely all of the above. Uh, you know, I unfortunately spend an inordinate amount of time on social media and, you know, trying to find vocalists is something that I'm interested in. I love music and I love performance of music and I love people that can do stuff that stop me in my tracks that go, how did you do that? And there's been some vocalists that I've been able to kind of find through social media that I've been really interested in. There's been vocalists that my management have have heard and discovered through numerous different channels. You know, again, one of the things is I have been in and around the industry now for a very long time. Uh, so there are people that might know people that know me that can get a message to me. There's loads of different ways. And, and for me, it's really key that I'm trying to work with people that have got something to say or they've got something to do. And, and and another thing that, you know, again, came out of the um, the lockdown and came out of Black Lives Matter and, and the George Floyd thing is to make sure that people are getting the right credit that they deserve. So it's making sure that, you know, that Annalisa LaMola, when we're working together on a song, that it's featuring Annalisa LaMola, if she wants to be featured on that record, because sometimes people don't want to, that, you know, mm. when I'm working with Kelly Lee, for a very long time, Kelly Lee wasn't credited on her records. And, you know, even one of the, when I ran a record label, one of our biggest records was Second Cities I Want to Feel. People don't know that that's Kelly Lee on the vocal of Second Cities I Want to Feel. And it's Daniel Beddingfield that's the male vocal, but they weren't vocally, they weren't credited as vocalists on the actual release. But it was important for me to make sure if me and Kelly Lee are working together on a song, 
that it's me and Kelly Lee. Do you know what I mean? So there's yeah. loads of different ways to find vocalists, but it's also making sure that everybody gets the credit that they want and that they deserve. It's mad when you. It's mad uh, looking at watching her. Watching just just aside, but watching her career. When I started Data Transmission, like right at the very beginning, fifteen years ago, we were kind of just we were trying to make ends meet and making like we were scratching like just doing lots of stuff to make money before we even focus on what we're doing. And one of the things we were doing was building websites. And I actually built Kelly Lee's website right back in first year of Data Transmission. And I kind of we were she was just starting working with like working with small underground house music labels then and doing some vocals then. And obviously now she's a big deal and it's been like crazy watching that kind of growth as well just in the kind of as a side thing she's truly do you know what she's really amazing and not only is she really amazing as a vocalist and a writer but she's also a really amazing businesswoman and that's the thing about this this, this industry the more that i've spent time in it the more that i realize you've got to wear a number of different hats you know you've got mm. to be You've got to have some sort of business acumen, or if you don't have it, you've got to make sure that you're working with people that do. You know, you've got to have some sort of awareness of of who you are and, and what it is that you do in and around this industry. Because if you aspire to have a career that lasts longer than five minutes, people will keep coming back around. And Kelly Lee is someone who is just extremely talented and extremely clever too. She's a brilliant businesswoman. Uh, Luke Vincent in the chat says, if a vocalist is signed to a label, how would you go about contacting them? Uh, it depends. Certain vocalists you can send demos to, certain vocalists you can't. It just, there's no set rule. That's also the thing that I find with with, with stuff like this is that there isn't a set <clears throat> rule. You could reach out to somebody that's signed and there is no reason why they could potentially work with you if they've got an, if you've got an idea that they really like. You could reach out to somebody that's signed that has got a clause in their contract that says that they can't work with anybody unless the record company said that they can. So it just, it really depends. We are in a space now where people's, con to be able to contact people is easier than ever. Sometimes people think that because they don't get a reply that they haven't been able to contact them. You've also got to remember that some people will have inboxes of DMs full of thousands and thousands of messages or inboxes of emails with thousands and thousands of messages, messages, but you can still contact them. So yeah, it doesn't matter who they are. Try. You never know what mm. might happen. Um, I know being an interviewer myself, myself, you get to speak to lots of producers and, and which you must be the same and which you end up sort of soaking up bits of their advice from their conversations. What key bits have you been? that you've kind of taken and is there anything you've taken and kind of you've taken of yourself along the time, along the road? That's a really good question. Um, there's been loads of advice over the years from, you know, MK telling me to kind of get out of my own way to, um, you know, the blessed Madonna telling me that, you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice is that, that she was given was to never read the comments. So, you know, I've actively tried to not read the comments, <laughs> which when you're reading your own socials is kind of hard, uh, but you know, I've actively tried that. And it's also, you know what? Again, that's where collaboration comes in. So a lot of the producers that I've worked with, uh, that I've spoken to over the years for radio or for any other kind of interview platform, always talk about the power of collaboration. And it took me years for it to actually, for the penny to drop. You know, every good producer that we know that we love over the years has collaborated with really, really good people. So the biggest piece of advice is, is the power of collaboration is working with people elevate what it is that you are doing to a point where you would never be able to do it by yourself. Yeah. You only have to look at like the big pop records for, as an example, you only have to look at the big pop records and you see that in like, you can see in a kind of really big numbers game. Like you can see when, when some of these records come out and it's like, so-and-so with so-and-so with so-and-so. And you're like, well, that's probably, you know, 50 million, you know, 500 million streams there because of, because of the three people that have been put together. I'm not dumb. It will definitely be put together at that level, you know, but it works down the, again, it works also, down the chain. It completely works down the chain. And let's also think about underground music. You know, the most underground of underground producers, when we think of Detroit techno, they were all working together. The Bellevue three were working mm. together. MK was there engineering in the studio. They were working together. It wasn't just one person that started the, the idea and then ended it. You know, Frankie Knuckles and, and the kind of the Death Mix crew and those guys were working together. And it's, mm. it's Daft Punk were working together. It's not one person, <laughs> it's two people. And, it, you know, looking at, at underground music, you go, there's so many samples 
in our underground music. You look at that and you go, immediately you're collaborating because you're taking a song that already exists and you're turning into something else. And each one of those songs that you're sampling, there's probably 50 people that have worked on that record. So it's, again, pulling yourself out of your own way and going, the power of collaboration is where you can finally get to a space where you're you're creating something that you can then put out into the world that would mean something to other people. What's going on in the rave shed? Who's who's trying to break in? Uh it's got a little bit windy, Milk Keynes. I don't know if you can hear it. I don't know if you can hear it, but we won't be in Kansas anymore, Toto. Holy moly. I, I thought we were gonna fully take off then. Holy moly, the roof was going. The disco balls were shaking. Oh my <laughs> days! <laughs> Listen, I thought the wizard. I thought the wizard was about to start popping up. <laughs> oh my days! That was that was a shaky, shaky moment. <laughs> oh, I'm just looking at. I'm looking at uh, the chat here. Uh, Skeleton Keys 100 says everyone's collaborating with Splice. <laughs> Man, see, this is again. One of the benefits of having been in the industry for as long as I have been is that I remember there used to be sample CDs from a company called Zero G that would put out these sample CDs. You'd be able to buy magazines that on the front of the magazine would be a CD with samples on it. So Splice is just a logical progression of that. You know, when you look back at some of the Zero G samples, some of the records that were made with those Zero G samples, Daft Punk's The Funk comes from a Zero G sample pack. So yeah, everyone's collaborating with Spice, but that's not new. Uh, I'm joking okay. just so you don't get so scared with all the wind. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Thanks, dude. I love it. I love it when a, I love it when other presenters come on. They can read the chat and engage. It's been cool. Anyway, right. Okay, we got a brand new record out. Tell me yes. about this new record. It's got a new again. You changed the sound a little bit and it's got to evolve the sounds. Tell me about this new record. Tell me about what's happening with it. So this is very much the kind of the culmination of everything that I've worked up until up until to now, trying to figure out the kind of music that I wanted to make, the statement that I wanted to make as an artist, the thing that I wanted to do. And again, I keep saying it, but I pulled it all the way back. And you'll notice on the artwork of this song is is a little record player that doesn't yeah. look too dissimilar to this record yeah, yeah. player. Sick. Like it's purposeful. It's purposeful to pull it all the way back and go, why am I interested in doing this? What do I want to do? And, and what does music mean to me? And Nothing Else Matters is my love letter to music because there's been so many times in my life where if it wasn't for music, I don't think I would have got through that particular moment. You know, I think back to my childhood of songs that I got lost in, albums that I got lost in. I think back to my teenage years, songs that I got lost in, albums that I got lost in. My career was because I was able to listen to music and, and want to share music with other people. And that's where I've got up to now as a producer where, you know, I've spent the last five years serving my apprenticeship as a producer. Now it's time for me to actually take it seriously and make a statement with my music. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, if I can move one person with this record in the way that records have moved me in the past, then I'm, I'm, I'm good. Let's play it. There we go. Let's give it the rave on. Welcome in those new people that join us from the front page. Hi, I'm Graham Farmer. He's Mr. Jam. That was his brand new single, Nothing Else Matters. So, unfortunately, I don't want to turn it off. I love that record, and I love Mr. Jam because he's been my good friend. So, thank you. Sorry, man. not 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 today. We're not going to be turning that off. I, I'm sorry you didn't enjoy it. Stick around for more interview though, because it's going to be it's been a great chat so far. Um, hey. Graham, Graham, I've been on the internet since Usenet. So yes, I am old. Don't feed the trolls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, do you know what? I, I love them, dude. I love. We we have a great time. It's great. <laughs> do you know? I, I tell you a little. Bas- I tell you a little story. Basically, when we were we were on the front page one time, someone came in and they were literally we were having a ch- we were full in deep chat into something, and they were like, "Play, uh, play, um, t- uh, two pack." Changes and that and literally the whole stream was true back to <laughs> and we were and we were and we were like and we were like we were like it's just not going to happen today. I'm really sorry, dude. Same. The do, amount, do, 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 do. And the we, amount and then, of times I've been a DJ, I've been playing somewhere, and someone's done exactly this. I'm in the middle of a house set <laughs> playing two pack. <laughs> so, but we now have a little picture of him in the shed. <laughs> 
that there's, it's now a shed anthem. <laughs> the only thing that I could say to that is that's just the way it is. Things are never changed. <laughs> Um, congrats on the new single. Um, thank you. I feel like I feel thank you've the, all, all of the music so far. Has been, like I want to just give you something. We have on our on my on my Monday streams. We uh we have demo streams every Monday. And basically, we listen to demos. We give feedback on demos. And there's two things we do on a demo stream. Uh, firstly, when we have a real banger that we absolutely love, we give it the Hulk smash, the ultimate accolade. So we'll give the we're going to give the the uh, nothing else matters the Hulk smash first and foremost. <laughs> secondly, secondly, tracks that are really, really hooky, we can give you the hook. And uh, <laughs> we can... <laughs> so, so for you, sir, for some great hooky tracks this afternoon, you can have the hook. Here you go. Why, thank you very much. That is the best accolade that I could ever wish for on anything that I've ever made in my life. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We do get a bit silly on Twitch. I love it. I love it. Um, can we chat about tea? Um, I, yes. We've we've seen your tea on your socials. Uh, the tea and cups of tea is now your drink of choice at gigs. Can we talk about the kind of why? And I, I personally know that you because we spoke about it on WhatsApp a bit. You you stop drinking, you stop and ditch the booze, and and sobriety's been your way for a long time. Can we can we talk about that? Can we talk about that a little yeah, bit sure. and tell us why and where we got to and how we got to that point. Where do I begin? I think you know. For me, I I I was not the the I was not the person that I wanted to be when I was drinking. I was drinking um, too much, and I knew that I needed to make a change. And it wasn't an easy road for me to make a change. But at the very point where I realised, do you know what? I I've gone too far. I'm damaging too many things. I'm damaging relationships. I'm damaging people around me. You know. I, I needed to make a change. And so I was able to ask for help and I got help and I haven't looked back since. And a lot of everything that has happened for me now um, has happened because of the change in the way that I used to think in the mm. change in what it is that I thought I needed to do for a very long time. I thought I needed to be a certain way, you know, speak to people in a certain way, do certain things, um, you know, drink certain drinks, do this kind of thing to be able to get ahead. And it was at the point where I let all of that go because I saw how much damage that I was causing to myself and other people that my life changed for the better. And so for me, the thing that I notice about, you know, the, the, the kind of the music industry is just how much drink is around. That you know, there's the there's the rider where you know you turn up to a gig and here's all the drinks and drink all the drinks and it's maybe to potentially get you as a performer on the same level as the crowd or whatever. But it always feels like you've constantly got to be on it and you don't because the best experiences that I've ever had DJing have been with a cup of tea beside my side or Pepsi Max cherry or a, a bottle of water and and nothing else. You know, I I managed to. to I was scared before I did it, but, you know, going and, and, and DJing with a cup of tea or whatever meant that I was connecting back to the music, meant that I could mm. actually feel what was going on rather than what I thought was going on. And, you know, it's the best thing that I ever did. And if you are someone that, you know, is in a situation where you feel like you're having to to do things that you don't really want to do because you've, you've just got no choice to do them, then there's so many places that you can get help and you don't have to because you're not alone. And, mm. you know, it goes back to even the collaboration thing of knowing that you can reach out to other people and ask for help is something that we don't tend to do in our industry, that we don't tend to do as people in the Western world, you know, and, and we're starting to get to a space now where the conversation's being normalized around mental health and around, you know, people drinking too much or whatever it may be. There's so many places that you can get help and you don't need to spend a penny to get that help. There's just so many places that you can go. And I'm so grateful that I did because I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for the fact that I did that. That's great to hear. I know, I know from myself, from like from, I, I know myself, I do now big periods of sober periods and, and I know it's, it, it's so much more productive. I get so much more done. Like I love being healthy and I love kind of just, you know, you achieve more during the day and, yeah, I just I, I love doing it and I love being part of it and and I, I again for, like I know myself it's it's 
I get my like I just I can't even think of a way to say it. I just get more done and I'm much more clear and I and I know what I want to do. I don't know where I want to get to, and it makes it happen much quicker. Um, so I completely hear you. And I, I, like, congratulations, man. That's that you're still like, Thank you. especially from a, especially from a gigs point of view. Like, that's the bit where I kind of struggle a little bit. The gigs point of view in the late nights. That must be must have been far, far hard at the start. But yeah, I, I, I do you know what? It, it, it's the more you do it, the less harder it gets. You know, mm. <laughs> because it, it's just it's just one of those things. And there's certain things that I just won't do now. There's certain things that again, learning that you have. The, the, the power to be able to go, this isn't something that I want to do. And if I'm then powerless over being able to do it, then there's a place that I can go to potentially get some help with that. Learning to know that you can make a change, that you can, you know, that you can do something, to try and help other people to make a change as well, I think is something that is really important. And I think, again, for you, when you're saying that you're having your periods of sobriety, that you feel like you're doing more, that's not the same for everyone. Some people feel like they don't have a choice in being able to have a period of sobriety or not. And that's also okay. It's just that thing of if you're in a space where you don't feel like you should be or that you shouldn't be or that you want to get yourself out of it, there's loads of places that you can go. And if you're doing too many things that that then mean that you, you, you know, that, you, that you're not achieving what you want to achieve or that you're not getting to where you want to get to, pull it all back and take it all the way back to start and go, am I actually the person that I want to be? And mm. I know for me, when when it came to the end of my drinking, it was a case of I'm not the person that I want to be. And that's kind of all I needed to do as the catalyst to, to begin where I am now. Government fans says, did you ever feel like something was missing when you'd done when when you'd done music when it when you stopped? Did you ever feel I like no, no. I think that um listening to music and playing music and DJing and making music um now is better than it ever has been. It's better than it ever has been. Like genuinely, and I'm not I'm not just saying it, it really, really has. You know, even, you know, as a broadcaster and, and being on the radio and the, and the connection that you have to people, the connection that you're able to have when you're not putting stuff in the way to the potential of that connection, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And I am very much, you know, not a religious person, but I'm a very spiritual person. And I believe in the power of music and I believe in the kind of, even when you pull it down to a scientific level, it's vibrations. So it's made to move you. And if you are numbing yourself from that movement, then are you really experiencing it? If you're numbing yourself from the wind in your shed, are you really experiencing the weather in Milton Keynes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 we'll be all right. It's been this shed's been through much tougher times than this than this little breeze. Ooh, don't, to it. <laughs> don't say breeze. Don't say breeze. <laughs> yeah, definitely, it's definitely vibrating the shed quite a lot. It'll be all right. I mean, as soon as I said vibrations, I just heard the shed go. Rawr, 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 rawr. <laughs> yeah. My last, my editor is gonna have a lovely time editing all the. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Someone needs to turn that into like a tear out drum and bass tune and just call it the shed wobbler. There you go. There you go. We we do have a shed shaker remote that we put in the chat. When, <laughs> when, when we have big when we have big rumbling tracks that sh there can be shed shakers. I have, I have a playlist on Spotify which is shed shakers. You're looking pretty trim, dude. Where are we? Are we still on the health like on the kind of healthy exercise tip? What are we doing? What like I'm 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 still running loads. What what are you doing? What's 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 working for you? I'm just trying to be the best version of me that I possibly can be on any given point in the day. I think, you know, I spent a very long time trying to be the person that's going to put up on the socials. Oh, look at how much I've been in the gym today. And, and look at this <laughs> and look at that and look at the other. And then I was like, no, because again, I'm doing this to try and get likes. Let me just stop and let me just focus on trying to be the best version of me that I can be. So today nice. I've, 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 I've not done anything, but I'm going to take the dog out for a walk later on. And, you know, we'll go and do something then. <laughs> nice. Love it. Love it. Okay. Let's play another track. I found, I, I was looking for this. <laughs> sorry, sorry. The, the comments just popped up. Skeleton keys 100. Do you even lift bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I lift spirits. That's what I do. I lift. I lift emotions. <laughs> let's, let's pull it back in. Let's pull it back in. <laughs> Sorry. You're good. You're good. It's, it's, <laughs> too much, it's too much fun. 
How the hell do you get through these? This is hilarious. I know it's good, isn't it? Wait, wait till you go get all the fancy dress out and all the stupid shit out. This is this is, this is bear jokes. <laughs> right. Uh, I found a track that was from earlier in the year, Defibrillator, on Techno. Yes. I love this label, and, and, and respect for putting on a label. That's a, that's a cool label. Um, I thought we'd play this. This is a cool track. When it be so hard, I'm going to need a defibrillator. Turn it up in the club, blow the face wide off the haters. When it be so hard, I'm going to need a defibrillator. Turn it up in the club, blow the face wide off the haters. Stand clear, please. Big. I like that track. Um, Thank you, mate. So, dude. So, dude. Basically, in my a long time in the first year of streaming, I set a, a challenge for my for my audience to go and make a track from uh, basically sampling part of my one of my YouTube streams or one of my Twitch streams, fully hoping they'd sample one of the guests, uh, and we get this really cool track. One of the guests talking or saying something cool. No, everyone sampled me. <laughs> that. <laughs> That turned into a record called The Kick Test, which basically Darius Sorosian picked up last summer and started playing all over the summer. But now on my Twitch streams on a Monday, uh, for those that join us for the first time, uh, we, stream, we listen to demos every Monday. Every Monday afternoon, one o'clock, we listen to demos from our Discord. One of the things we have as part of that stream is the tracks like that with big thumping kicks. I've seen a lot of my shed heads in the, in the chat asking for it. It definitely, definitely passes the kick test. So... Okay, pass the kick test. I quite like the kick. Thank you. <laughs> It passes a kick test. I mean, come on, you just give me all the presents today, man. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a track, I'll send you after. There's a track with basically my voice saying pass the kick test, and it goes Brr. and there's a producer called MXL. He made it, we released it. It got it's done about a hundred thousand streams already. It's, it's it's funny as and and my my voice booms out over over Clubland, which is fucking ridiculous. And but it needs to happen funniest. again. Yeah, no, 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 don't, so don't. Yeah, they all do it. They'll just sample me in, like there's tracks with me in it all over the place. I get so much publishing, it's it's mental. And there's the sample, guys, go with it. <laughs> yeah, there, there it is, there it is. Looks like. um, someone asked me in the chat, where did that chat, what did it say? Someone asked me the question, I'm going to take a question from the audience. What did it say? It said, we need to get Mr. Jam's top five plugins that he uses. Yes, Ooh. that's a good idea. Okay. Uh, first of all, Shaper Box. Absolutely love Shaper Box. Um, there's, I'm only really scratching the surface of, of what that entire kind of suite of things can do. Uh, I really, really love it. Um, I was really, really angry when Waves recently went to their, um, oh, you now have to subscribe to be able to use our plugins. And then they immediately uh, drew it all back because I do love uh, using quite a lot of Waves plugins. I think Sound Shifter is probably my most used Waves plugin. Uh, that is one of those tunes that allow, uh, that's one of those plugins that allows you to kind of change the pitch of whatever it is that you're using on that particular channel. And it does it really, really well. There's a great algorithm there. I am not a mix engineer, even though the first thing that I learned how to do was mix. I'm not a mix engineer. So anything that you hear of mine that has been released has been through my amazing mix engineer that I actually found on Instagram, a guy called Ollie Knight. He is absolutely brilliant. If you need someone to mix your tunes to sound like the best they possibly can be, go and hit him up. Um, but I obviously have Isotope uh, Ozone. I've got Ozone 10. And I absolutely love the audio lens feature where you can literally, you can listen to any tune on your laptop. It will take the settings from that tune and allow you to put it onto the record that you're working on. So for me, as I'm working on something, just having a rough idea of how it might sound when it's mixed properly really helps me in that kind of production process. Um, so Ozone 10. And then is that, that's four, isn't it? And then, and then the fifth. I quite like the mastering the mix stuff. So they're uh, a German company 
really like what it is that they're doing. Um, they've got this 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 uh, plugin called Base Room that allows you again to it's a, it's a mix helper because I'm I'm not the I, my ears are shot from years so other people mix it down for me to make it sound amazing. But what it allows me to do is it allows me to put that on a particular channel where there is bass for me to then be able to kind of set it so that I can then produce around how it might then potentially sound. So then when it is mixed properly, it will sound great. Cool. Which ones are you using in the chat? Are we feeling those? Let me know. I want to, let's get this chat going. I love the plugin chat. It's always a, it's always a regular one. <laughs> right. We've got about 10 minutes left. Shit, the bed. We're running out of time. We've got still got loads of questions. Right. Go for it. Uh, let's chat to DJing quickly. Uh, we've chatted production. We've chatted radio. We've chatted mental health. Thanks for sharing that, dude. Let's chat DJing. Where to start? Shit, the bed. Uh, let's, let's talk about the new series you've just started on DJing on, on socials. Um, You've just started this. You've I can I don't know if anyone's seen in, in the chat. If you have on his Instagram, we've been building the studio, which is behind him. Why did we start these? What was the inspiration? How are they going? What's the plan? The whole inspiration behind it is that I can't expect anybody to know what it is that I'm doing now and what it is that I would play in a club if I were to be booked now, or what it is that I might potentially turn up and do if you were to to book me for your you know, for your festival or whatever, if I'm not putting out the content myself. And I thought that, you know, being able to put out the music that I was putting out, you know, changing what was happening with me at broadcast and launching Capital Dance would help and, and you know, putting out music that I want to play in the club that is very much where I would want to be uh, was enough, but it's not because what will happen is, is that I still get people that are like, oh, could you come and play this that you played 15 years ago, or, you know, we've got this lineup with these particular artists and it's all people that, you know, that I might have worked with 10 years ago, but I've changed as an artist and I'm doing what I truly believe in as an artist now. So doing online streams, doing, you know, YouTube, um, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok streams of me here in this studio playing not only my own demos and stuff that, you know, that I'm trying to get out there and I'm sending to labels and labels are passing on, but I still believe in them. Um, or, you know, music that I really am passionate about, but isn't necessarily the music that I would play on the radio. Because again, taking it back to our radio conversation, there are certain records that would work fantastically in the middle of a club set that if you played at 1 p.m. in the afternoon would make everybody go, what the hell is this? And switch off. So yeah, <laughs> it's an opportunity for me to be able to go, this is what I do. If you book me to go and play at a club, this is what I want to play. This is how I want to play it. And also, you know what? I've actually got a really cool space. Thanks to Mrs. Jam doing all of the work of putting the stuff up on the walls. Um, and I don't know if anybody saw the uh, Instagram post that I did of when we changed this room around. You'll see at one point I'm doing stuff and then I disappear for the majority of the post because Mrs. Jam then builds the table. <laughs> it's that. It's Yeah, it's just making the most of it and, and just trying to get out there that, look, what you might have known Mr. Jam to be five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, isn't who I am now. I've evolved. I've changed. And if you'd like to get to know what it is that I do, then let me put it to you front and centre. If you go to my socials now, if you go to my Instagram, if you go to my TikTok, you'll see me talking about things that I've learned across the years, the, the kind of the, the nuggets of gold that I've got. You, you'll see me DJing. You'll see me playing the music that I really believe in, that I want to play in clubs. You'll see me talking about my tune. You know, this is this is this is what I am, and this is who I am, and. It's taken a long time for me to be feel feel comfortable in my own skin, but now that I am, I, I want to shout about it. So that's, that's it's great. I love it. I, it's literally everything I shout about on a Friday and, and on YouTube, and I love it. I, it literally, like I love that you're doing it. I, I, when I saw it, I was like, "Yes, someone else is doing it. Yes, amazing." And I, <laughs> I love it. I, I think I, I I agree with you. Like you have to show people, and you have to literally constantly remind people what you're doing and what you're doing now. And I, I think like. I love that you're doing it. It's, uh, it's it's making my content a lot easier for sure. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Thanks, hey, dude. I'm stealing all the ideas off you. That's what I'm, I'm, you know. I just I look at what you posted. And gone. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've got five minutes left. Shh. Right, shall I, let's shall I, should we do questions from the audience? Let's let's go for it. Let, I'm going to try and get through the loads of these. Right, right. Uh, I saw one a minute ago. If you're self-releasing through publishers like TuneCore, is it worth it? Uh, it depends what you want to do, but every single 
company that you can potentially work with, make sure you read the terms and conditions before you sign anything. Just read the terms and conditions. If you don't know what it is that you're signing, uh, then spend the money that you would potentially have to spend on getting a lawyer to look over it. Just read the terms and conditions before you sign anything. Do you think, do you think there's still value in, in a radio plugger? I think there is definite value in a radio plugger, depending on where you are in terms of your momentum. Um, go back to what the conversation that we had bloody hell over an hour ago now about <laughs> where you might be <laughs> in your life cycle of you as an artist and your record might be. There's no point engaging a radio plugger when you're a completely unknown artist with a song that you haven't got any traction on whatsoever. Yeah, that was, uh, I've, I've been thinking about that conversation a bit since we had that over an hour ago. Um, I guess... Because obviously they, people want you to play it on Capital Dance, and then you want. But we were saying that they have to build that momentum. Are people better sending you a track for your DJ sets so that then that gets the momentum before it gets to Capital Dance? Is that is that a, I, an idea? See, this is but this is the thing for me. I'm just interested in hearing great music, and not every great song that I really could play in a club, I can't play on the radio. And similarly, mm. it's don't necessarily just aim for me. If you've mm. got friends, and, and look. The best example of this is what has happened in Dublin and Belfast with the Irish scene, where you're seeing these artists come out of the Irish scene because they're growing together, because they're making music together, because they're supporting each other. They're reposting each other's content. They're making music. They're playing alongside each other. You know, you're seeing Belters only work with Jazzy, work with Shane Codd, working with Welshy, working with Kaz. Working. There's just so many of these producers that are coming through from Ireland because everybody's working together and they're amplifying what each of them are doing. That is 100% a lesson that we can learn over here. The thing that I find about the dance music scene in the UK right now is it is still very much that mean girls thing of you can't sit with us and mm. you're not cool enough to be here and you aren't allowed to do this. You aren't allowed to do that. No, the, the, the unity, the power is in the strength and in the unity. And the more that we can all work together, the more that you can look to your friends, your mate that might have a residency at a local club. If he's playing your tune, every week and he's rinsing your tune you're actually going to get shazam numbers off the back of that you know it's that kind of thing putting it on soundcloud and jumping in with a, a community and building it and building it so when you are approaching someone like me who's had a few years in the game that has had that has to listen to a lot of stuff you're telling me this is happening with the record that's happening with the record that's happening with the record that's happening with the record and i can go brilliant i now can listen i now know where it's coming from and can't listen to everything because otherwise my entire time would be spent by listening to everything but there's no <laughs> short answer to that question gray and i know we were doing quick fire <laughs> i know it's cool it's cool it's cool cool uh production question how do you start with radio edits or do you start with extended edits i used to start with extended edits and then i realized that what would happen is that my radio edits were too long i start with radio edits and then i build out i start about thinking about what's working right now on radio is about two minutes 45 seconds what can I say in two minutes and 45 seconds that is good, that is, that is necessary? And then how can I extend that to five minutes so that I can continue to hold somebody's attention throughout the entire run of that five minutes? But if I start with five minutes, it's harder to chop it down. Start shorter, then build out. It's very cool. Uh, last question. Who's got one? Who's got one in the chat? Go for it right now. Mario Tavares what? says, how long before I start a label? I did that. Don't want to do it anymore. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that was on my list, but we did. We've run out of time, man. Uh, we've so run out of time. I've got so much more. What do you think of Spotify's discovery mode? You know? It will never replace DJs. Um, but ultimately, if it can put your music in front of somebody that might never have searched for you before, it can only be a good thing. You've just got to remember that you've only got a very short period of time to make that impression on that potential listener. So make sure you're only uploading the very, very best that you possibly can. And then finally, what's happening the rest of the year? What you got? What, what's happening that's exciting for you the rest of the year? Um, do you know what? Bucket list. Um, bucket list booking. Uh, this summer, I, I'm going to be at Pasha in Ibiza a few times over the summer. I've oh, yeah. always wanted to play Pasha. I've never played Pasha yet. I spent many a night in Pasha dreaming of being behind the decks, but I'm going to be there a few times over the summer. Uh, there's a few things that are potentially happening as well that I can't talk about just yet. But really my focus is on just not only building what we're doing over at Capital Dance, 
as again, it's a dance music station where everybody is welcome. We are inclusive, not exclusive. Um, but also as a producer, you know, being able to, to release music and being as vulnerable as I am with the music that I'm releasing. That's taken a long time for me to be able to get here, but you know, nothing else matters is the focus. Uh, there might be some more club tunes if, you know, if other labels feel like they want to pick them up and if not, nothing else matters is the focus and watch this space. Amazing. Mr. Jam, thank you so much for joining me on Twitch. It's been so much fun this afternoon. Thanks for doing it, dude. Great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you've had a good time. No, thank you, Graham. Honestly, you know, you and I have had numerous conversations over the years, a lot of which are private conversations that will never be shared. But I just want to say thank you to you because for a very long time, you were one of the few people that would really bang the gong for me. And it's it's it will never be forgotten. And the thing that you're building with data transmission and the thing that you're continuing to build with your own streams, with everything, if I can help in any way, you know where I am. You're an absolute legend. Thank you. Oh, thanks, dude. Thanks, dude. I see I see, I see loads of people asking if we can come on come on, on Monday to listen to demos. That'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Monday's my day off. I've got study day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wicked. Right, let's maybe I'll let one you go. Day, maybe one day. I won't say never. I won't say never. I've, I've drank a full flask of tea, so I've got to go and re up on this. Go and walk the dog. Me too. Me too. Thank you for Stoods. I'll see you very soon. Thank you for being here. Gang, I'm going to hang about and we'll, let's get. I'll say goodbye. See you, dude. Bye bye. If you found this interview interesting, consider giving it a like and a comment. It helps with the YouTube algorithm and let me know your biggest takeaway below. Don't forget to follow me on Twitch. I'm back on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and you can check out the schedule from the link below as well to see who's coming up in my interview series. I'll see you in the next Twitch stream or the next YouTube video. I'll see you soon. Bye.